again, if we've not had a chance to meet, my name's Jason Rumbo. I'm the teaching pastor here at Hope, and we're so glad you're here. Forgive my voice. My son, Luca, had a double header yesterday, and I was a very, um, how shall we say, engaged dad, you know? And so uh, it was a lot of fun. But um, thank you so much for, for being here, whether you're here masked in person or you're watching online. Thank you so much for just joining us today. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. If you want to go ahead and turn there, if you don't have your Bible, that's fine. You can pull it up digitally or um, it'll be on the screen behind me. Um, we're going through what uh, a lot of scholars call, or maybe you, if you grew up in the church, you heard it called the Sermon on the Mount. And specifically, over the past several weeks and over the next several weeks, we're looking at something called the Beatitudes. Um, you may have heard it, blessed are those, and he kind of keeps going. And what we're looking at here in the midst of these Beatitudes is that Jesus is trying to communicate something to a group of individuals, both in his context and in ours. And so we're going to look and unpack what that means in the next part of this journey together this morning. Uh, I know you just sat down, but I'm going to invite you as we read the Word of God, would you just stand with me for a few moments while we read Matthew chapter 5? Matthew, writing about Jesus, says this in chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowd, he, that's Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This is the word of the Lord. You may have a seat. Well, the way this whole thing starts off, as we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks, Jesus kind of, he sees this crowd forming over here, kind of near the city. And he's like, hey, guys, we're going to go this way. So he walks up the side of this hill. And a group of men and women follow him. And Matthew uses the word mathetes, which a lot of our translations interpret as the word disciple, to talk about who this group of men and women were. But if we really understand what that word mathetes means in our kind of postmodern 21st century context, the closest word we really have to it is the word apprentice. Now, in first century Judaism, an apprentice of a rabbi or a teacher like Jesus was committed to doing three things. The first was they were committed to being with him. That's like they're sleeping next to him. They're following him on this journey. They're hearing everything he says. And they are with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. As they are with him, this next kind of thing happens is that they become like him. So they're with him. They become like him. And then eventually, after this process kind of works its way in the life of the apprentice, they end up doing what the, their rabbi did. And what we've said for us at Hope Church is this. We are not committed to learning facts about Jesus. That's just not what we're about. Right? We want to learn things about him, but that's not all what we really are summed up with. Like, we're not necessarily about just trying to be a good moral person. There's something much deeper at stake here. And so for us, as people who are engaged with one another, as what we call Hope Church, our desire is to do the same thing the first century Jews did. We want to be with Jesus. And as we are with him, we become like him. And then eventually we end up doing what he did. Or the way we say it is we do what he would do if he had your marriage. Or if he had your kids. Or if he had your job. Or your neighbor that always leaves the trash can out on Mondays and never brings it back in. That's just... A little, I'm a little sensitive about this, all right? But the idea is this, this being eventually moves into transformation. And that's what Jesus is all about. The invitation to follow is an invitation to join him on this journey. And he kind of kicks this whole thing off by talking or kind of giving his vision statement, which is this. He says, repent or change your mind or change your understanding of what religion and what following has always been because the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is here. 
Now for us at Hope Church, what we've said is the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is God's presence and God's power at work in the here and in the now. There are some religious traditions that will say, hey, if you really want to encounter God, you've got to go halfway around the world on this journey to get there and then maybe if you're lucky, he'll meet with you. There are others who say, hey, God's not going to meet with you unless you pray a certain way or in a certain position with a certain body posture or having a certain whatever. But what Jesus said is this, hey, no, 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 the kingdom of God, God's presence, God's power is here. It's now. It's not just something that you're waiting to come when you die, but it's here and it's now. And Jesus begins talking about the people who are in the kingdom by using the word that a lot of our translations uh, indicate as blessed, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. And he goes on and on. Well, that word blessed is actually a Greek word, makarios, which means this. Welcome. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Gosh, it's good to see you. Congratulations, you made it. And that's what Jesus is getting at. He's going through each of these things and he's saying, hey, Welcome to the poor in spirit, or I love the way Luke's gospel translates it. Welcome to those who are dirt poor. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is their birthright. Then he goes on, he's like, welcome to those who are experiencing gut-wrenching sadness due to loss. Why? Because they will be comforted by the Holy Spirit. Last week we looked at this. Welcome to those who are gentle. Why? Because they are the ones that are going to inherit the earth. And this week we're looking at another category of individuals to whom Jesus says, welcome, I'm glad you're here. And it's those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why? Because they will be filled. Now, if you're like me and you have any kind of religious tradition or have grown up in the church at all, a lot of times what we've heard is we've heard this verse taught with a meaning that goes something like this. Blessed are those who want forgiveness from their past mistakes because they will get it. And to some extent, that's like true. But what happened for me when I was a kid is I was like always the kid that always felt like I had done something wrong. Like a lot of fear, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame was used to make me feel like I was never forgiven enough. And so I remember, man, I I would go to these youth camps and every time they gave like a call to walk the aisle, that's what I'm doing. I'm going down because I'm not sure that I really meant it last time, And even if I did, I know that I'd kind of done some stuff since then that I probably need to kind of fess up on. And so it was like every time there was an invitation to rededicate my life, I was there. It didn't matter where it was. Summer camp, I'm there. Church, I'm there. Like Chick-fil-A at a table, like yes, like bring it on. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I was doing this hundreds of times. And I became, I grew up just very afraid that the last time didn't stick. So I've got to do it again. And so when I hear this verse, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, maybe I wasn't hungry enough. Maybe maybe I I didn't do enough last time. Maybe I wasn't actually sincere because if I was really serious, I wouldn't have done it again. And I, I grew up with this idea and it's because of this understanding of what righteousness is. When we hear the word righteousness, a lot of times what we think of is moral rightness or religious purity or some sort of like behavioral accomplishment. We get this idea from a guy named Paul who lived several years after Jesus who wrote a bunch of letters where he included this word righteousness or, or justification or forgiveness within his letters. And in some senses, that's actually what the word righteousness means. And when you kind of look at Paul's teachings, he talks about how righteousness has to deal with like a forgiveness of a debt. And Jesus gets into this at some point uh, later on in the book of Matthew in chapter 18. He tells a story of a king who had a lot of money, and he was loaning out some money to some of his friends, or some of his servants, rather. And one servant, he he was like, all right, guys, it's time to pay up. It's collection day, and this servant shows up, and he owes the king, like, millions of dollars. And the king is like, hey, buddy, I need you to pay this today. And the guy's like, I I don't don't have that in my bank account. I, I can't do that. The king says, okay, well, there's really only one way to really make sure that we're even. you got to go to prison and work off the debt. And the guy's like, but my family, my kids, my job, like I, I can't do that. And the king, it says that the king had compassion on this individual, on the servant, 
so the king says, you know what? Tell you what. We're going to just erase that debt. I will forgive that debt. And it says the servant went away, and he was like, are, are you kidding me? Like, this is amazing. I, I don't owe a dime of this. Like, I don't have to just not pay it back, but, like, I'm cleared. And it says that as soon as the servant leaves the palace, he goes around the corner, and he sees a friend of his. And his friend owes him, like, 100 bucks. And he's like, hey, man, um, I need you to pay me that $100. This amazing thing just happened, and I want to take my family out to Texas Roadhouse, and like we need to get going, right? And the guy's like, "Well, I don't, I don't have a hundred bucks." The king said, or the, the servant says, "What do you mean you have a hundred? Like I owed you that money, I lent you that money. You owe me that money. You got to pay it back now." And he says that the guy gets so angry, he takes the second guy and throws him in prison. Well, guess who finds out? The king. The king's like, "Whoa, wait a minute, dude. Let, let's have a little chat. You owed me millions of dollars." And I'll let you go scot-free. This dude owes you a hundred bucks and you throw him in prison? He says, now here's what's going to happen. I'm going to kick you out. And not only am I going to kick you out of my presence, I'm going to kick you into prison. And you're going to stay there the rest of your life until every last penny of your original millions of dollars is paid back. That's the idea of forgiveness that Paul takes up. This idea of, hey, we had this huge debt that was owed to God, and God sent his son Jesus to pay for this debt on our behalf because we couldn't pay him back. And Paul takes us and he runs with it. And so what we do is we go, yes, yes, I have this massive amount of guilt in my soul because of all the sin that I've accrued since birth that I was even born into. And so we come to God and we're like, God, I'm sorry. Like, please forgive me. And God's like, okay. And then we stop. We think that this idea of righteousness is that we just say we're sorry and then we're good. But that's not the whole picture. There's a real danger lurking in a lot of churches in our community, in our country, and around the world that teaches a half gospel. It's a half truth. Because what it does is it teaches forgiveness of sins and that's it. And so we're left with this version of Christianity that says, look, All you have to do is feel fear and guilt and shame about your life choices, ask for forgiveness through a prayer, and you're going to go to heaven when you die. And so for now, um, pray, try to be nice, and just wait until you're dead. But when we do this, what happens is we fall very short of what God intended for us as his apprentices. And what happens is over time, it causes us to say and believe things that sound good. They sound right. They actually sound humble, but they're actually based on an incomplete version of the story. Here's an example of what I hear a lot. I hear people when I'm saying, hey, tell me about your spiritual journey, especially people who grew up in the church. We're we're really uh, bad about doing this. I hear people say, man, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Yeah, I've said that. And when I hear that, honestly, it kind of, it makes me feel a little weird inside. And here's why. The Bible tells us a story about a guy named Simon who was a fisherman. He kind of dropped out of Hebrew school. He wasn't really hacking it, so he moved back home with his mom and dad to take up the family business. Well, then this rabbi, this amazing young rabbi named Jesus comes out and he finds him and he says, hey, Simon, I want you to come with me. Come and follow me. So that's what Simon does. Simon leaves everything behind and he follows him. And he learns, he's an apprentice of Jesus, he's with him, and he becomes like him. Eventually he goes on to do what he did, and at one point, Jesus is having this conversation with Simon, and he's like, hey, who do you say I am? And Simon's like, you're the Messiah, you're the one we've been waiting for. And Jesus is like, that's exactly right. And now you're no longer Simon, you're Peter. And Peter goes on to become one of the cornerstones, one of the bedrocks of the first church movement. It's why we're here today. Now, was Simon just a fisherman? Well, kind of. But was that all he was? No. Well, what about a guy named Saul? Y'all remember Saul, right? He's a guy who learned all there was to learn about the religious system. He was so good at it. He found loopholes within the Christianity movement. And so he decided he was going to take all this knowledge and he was going to use it to slaughter the church. And not only did he persecute, he murdered people in the name of the law so that they would no longer follow this guy named Jesus. Well, what happens? Jesus meets him. And he's like, hey, guess what? 
You're not Saul anymore. You're now Paul, and I'm going to send you out into the nations. Now, was Saul just a murderer? No. He was somebody who had an encounter with Jesus, and that led him on an incredible journey that was not defined by who he used to be, but by what God was doing in him on an everyday basis. Now, let me ask you this. The same thing goes for us. I mean, are we born separated from God, from one another and ourselves, what the Bible calls sin? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does that separation in us create behaviors that drive us to further separation? Things like anger and jealousy and bitterness? Yes. Do we have an opportunity to accept Jesus' invitation to follow him and receive healing and restoration that that separation caused in our souls? Yes. But are we just the sum of those things? No. And I think that when we believe that, it leads to a very dangerous type of theology. Here's what I mean. First, if all we are is just sinners saved by grace, then when we describe ourselves as the sum of what we used to be, we run the risk of never growing beyond what it was that we used to be. Think about it like this. My wife and I, uh, Kelly, we've been married for 15 years. And every Thursday night, we have date night. Sometimes we stay in, we send the kids upstairs to watch Disney, we cook a meal downstairs and just hang out. Uh, Sometimes, like this past Thursday, we go out. We went to Once Upon a Time in France. You guys ever been there? It's right across the street. Amazing food. I can't pronounce the menu, but I'm like, it works, right? But imagine like we went out on one Thursday night and you and your significant other joined us on this little date and we're hanging out, we're chatting, and you leaned in and you said, Jason, tell me, you've been married 15 plus years. I'm like, yeah. And you're like, what's the secret? And I said, you know, I'm just a single guy that got married. You'd be like, what? <laughs> like, like there's, there's got to be more. I'm like, nope, I'm just a single guy who got married. Now, is that true? Yes. Was I single and did I get married to an amazing woman? Yes. Is the fact that I still don't wear my t-shirts tucked into my jeans the product of my wife's influence? Yes. Like, those are great things, right? We all praise God for those things. But is that all I am? Is that all my marriage is? Yeah, I hope not. Why? Because not only is that an inaccurate picture of my current relationship status, It's dishonoring to my wife of 15 plus years of life together that include joy, struggle, memories, four kids, things that we've done together. You know, as a side note too, I think this is a lot of times why people who are in conflict in marriage have issues in their marriage. It's because they approach it as two single people who just happen to be married rather than the idea of what it means to live life beyond singleness. It can be very dangerous for us if we're just a sinner saved by grace. Why? Because we run the risk of never growing beyond whatever that was. Second, to quote Epictetus, who was a first century Greek philosopher, we become whatever we give our attention to. So if our mind and our attention is fixed on who we used to be, our just this, I'm just an addict, I'm just a divorcee, I'm just a dropout, I'm just whatever it was, then we end up letting that become the place that we drift back toward. You are what you give your attention to. If we're only giving our attention to the things that we used to be, the sins we used to live in, or the way that we used to walk, as Paul says, then guess where we're going to drift to? Back to those things. When we fall into the trap of thinking that we're just sinners saved by grace, we end up falling into the trap of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, calls cheap grace. It's forgiveness, but no transformation. And subsequently, there's no action. Jesus tells a story in Matthew 25 of of a rich guy. And he has three servants, and he's getting ready to go on this trip. And he's like, all right, he tells the first one, I'm going to give you $100,000. The second one, I'm going to give you $10,000. The third one, I'm going to give you $1,000. And I'm going to go away on this trip, and I'm going to come back at some point. And while I'm gone, I want you just to do something with the money. So he leaves. So as he comes back after a long journey, 
And he shows up and he's like, all right, guys, like, what did you do? The first servant that he gave $100,000 to, he was like, hey, look at this. I invested it in this, this stock portfolio and I took your 100 grand and I made it 200 grand. And the master was like, that is awesome. Like, thank you. That's, that's amazing. The second guy, he said, hey, I took your 10K and I invested it in some rental property. Okay, it took a little, a little slow start, but man, we got there. And now you went from 10K to 20K. You are now $20,000 richer. The master was like, way to go. The third servant, he was like, okay. If he liked that, he's going to love what I've got. And the, the master goes, okay, I gave you $1,000. What would you do with it? And he says, well, I took your $1,000 and I knew you were going to come back. And I knew that you were going to ask me what I did with it. And I was so afraid of losing it that I took all the money out of the bank. I got 10 $100 bills, put it in an envelope, and I shoved it under my mattress. And here, and he pulls out this crumpled envelope, here's your money. And it says the master looks at this third servant and he says, you foolish, wicked, lazy servant. You knew what my heart was. You knew who I was at my core. That I didn't want you just to take this and sit on it, literally. I want you to do something with it. And what does he do? He kicks him out of the house. And that's the same thing that is happening with us in our apprenticeship to Jesus. When it comes to being an apprentice of Jesus, are we all those things that I mentioned previously? Yes. But is that all that we are? No. I would even go further to say that if we understand this text in Matthew 5 as those who simply desire forgiveness from sin and moral uprightness will get it, then we grossly misunderstand the entire life and teachings of Jesus Christ. So, that's the bad news. What is Jesus saying here? Well, the word or the understanding really hinges on this word righteousness. Now, the word righteousness comes from this Greek word, the chaos, which has a couple of different meanings. The first is what we've already looked at in, in, um, in Romans, where Paul talks about justification and forgiveness. But the second is actually what Jesus' understanding was, who lived long before Paul was ever on the scene. See, to a first century Jew, the word dikaios meant somebody who practices covenant faithfulness. Or those who keep the Torah. Now, if you remember, the Torah was the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the idea behind the Torah was it was the law given by God to a guy named Moses for the people of God called the Israelites. And it was going to be this, this idea, this moral code, this law that they were to live by so that when they go into the promised land or the land God was going to give them, they would know how to act. And so God's like, hey, I'm going to give this thing to you and I want you to live by it. Now, in this code of ethics or in this law, there is an undercurrent of forgiveness that's there. But it's also contained within it a great deal of teachings on justice and social issues. For an example, Deuteronomy 16, verse 20. The law says this, Cursed be anybody who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. Amos 5.24, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Isaiah 1.17, Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. Jeremiah 22, Do justice and righteousness. And deliver from the hand of the oppressor, the one who's been robbed. And don't do wrong or violence to the foreigner that lives among you, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. And it goes on and on and on. This right here is the same lens that Jesus is using when he is talking about welcome to those who hunger and thirst, those who crave righteousness. He's saying, hey, welcome to those who crave justice. Why? Because they will be satisfied. And this understanding of justice and righteousness is something that Jesus uses over and over again. For example, Matthew chapter 10, verse 41. Jesus says this, whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of a righteous person. Now, if our understanding of righteous is forgiven, it sounds a little weird. I mean, Whoever welcomes a forgiven person in the name of a forgiven person will receive the word of a forgiven person. Like, what does that mean? 
right? In, verse, in chapter 23, verse 27, Jesus is condemning the scribes and Pharisees. He says, hey, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. You guys are hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you, you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Again, forgiveness doesn't seem to fit here. In fact, Jesus has a conversation with a guy in Matthew 22, and he's talking about this whole understanding of what the law really means. And the guy's like, hey, help me understand this. How can we understand what the law and the prophets are all about? Jesus says two things. Remember what they were? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the other? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the entirety of the law. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer follows up cheap grace with. He, he says there's also a costly grace. And it's costly because it costs a man his life. And it's grace because it gives a man the only true life he'll ever understand. Jesus makes this distinction between cheap grace and costly grace, or what, I, what I'll call um, life beyond forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 25, it's going to be on the screen behind me, but I just kind of want to read this to you in its context. It's, it's pretty enlightening. Starting verse 31, Jesus says this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep at his right hand and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And a lot of our traditional understanding of what this means we would say, hey, come, those who have prayed a prayer, those who have sought forgiveness and who have gotten forgiveness. But that's not what he says. Let's keep going. Verse 35. Why? Because I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous, it's the same word Jesus used in Matthew 5, the righteous will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and give you food? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, what? You did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. I was naked, you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he answers them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous, there's that word again, the chaos, the righteous into eternal life. Here's, here's what Jesus is saying here in Matthew 5, 6. Welcome. Congratulations. I'm glad those who are here. Welcome. I'm glad you're here to those who hunger and thirst, those who crave covenant faithfulness, justice to those who are the least of these. Because they will be satisfied. They will see justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is why for us here at Hope Church, our mission statement, our lifeblood is we exist to what? To bring hope to our community. How? By practicing the way of Jesus. What is Jesus' way? This is Jesus' way. What we just saw by practicing the way of Jesus. How long do we go? Until East Nashville. Until Davidson, Williamson County until Tennessee, until the United States of America, until our entire world is as it is in heaven. 
Now, it would be very unfair for me to give you this challenge and not follow it up with a, not follow it up with a here's how you do it. So I'm going to actually ask two friends of mine, um, Zach Bevel and Joel Frame, to come on up here. And we're going to do a little bit of a Q&A. You guys give them a hand as they walk up here, please. Come on. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, let me get you guys to grab a stool here. Um, we're just going to have a little uh, question and answer time. I'm going to introduce these guys to you. And uh, that's my chair, bro. I'm just, I'm just I'm messing with you, man. I'm messing with you. <laughs> um, so those of you guys who know Joel and Zach, or maybe who don't know Joel and Zach, um, Joel is actually on staff with us here at Hope Church, and he is the director of outreach and community here. Um, and Zach, he is the operations and programming director at Project Connect Nashville. Did I get that right? Did, did I get yours right? Because I always like, I, 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 every time I introduce Joel, I give him a different title. So um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and these guys both represent areas of our community that we are heavily involved in, areas of our community that we are uh, wanting to become more involved in. So I've asked them to hear just to answer a couple of simple questions um, about what they do and um, what it means for us as a church and us as individuals, all right? So Joel, we're just going to start with you, man. Tell me a little bit about who you are and the ministry that you are currently involved with, not just Hope Church, but just kind of some other ministry that you're, you're involved with as well. So yeah, my name's Joel Frame, and um, I am a husband to Tracy, and we have four daughters, and um, I started at a very early age, uh, started using drugs, and uh, which culminated over through my teenage years and in my 20s and into my early 30s, becoming a very, very serious battle with drug addiction and alcoholism. It culminated in uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, a plan to end my life, and um, because of my wife and her boldness and ferocity and leadership, um, I'm here. And she, she fought for me, she stood in my place, and she led me into a place uh, of recovery. And so I've been in recovery for almost three years now. June 16th, 2018 is my clean date, and so we're coming up on three years. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm heavily involved in personally uh, for my own life and recovery, but with a community of people in recovery from drug addiction and alcoholism. Mm. Joel, one of the things that I love about Joel is we've, we've talked a lot. He's, these two guys are some of my best friends. And uh, one of the things that Joel talks about a lot is the difference between being an addict and being a user. Um, would you just kind of unpack that for us real quick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I could honestly, like, as I was trying to think through this, could do, like, a four-week, like, series on this. And we may have that happen. Like, yeah. we may need to make that happen. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but anyways, I came to this place uh, uh, the beginning of last year where um, if any of you have ever been to or seen on TV or movie or something, a Narcotics Anonymous meeting or Alcoholics Anonymous meeting or one of the anonymous meetings, you know that when somebody shares... What they say is, hey, I'm Joel, and I'm an addict, and then we share. And if you don't say that, people will say, who are you? And you'll go, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm Joel, I'm an addict. And they're like, hey, Joel, you know, and then you share. I got to this place in my recovery last summer crying in Jason's office because I was like, I was torn because I had gotten to this place in my faith where Jesus had set me free but I was still having to call myself an addict. And, and I, I came head to head with this verse in John that says that whom the son sets free, he is free indeed. And so I had this vision of sitting in one of the Narcotics Anonymous rooms and, and going to share and Jesus sitting next to me and me going, hey, I'm Joel, I'm an addict. And I had this vision of Jesus going, why are you saying that still? Why do you still say that? And so it started to cause me to, to really question that because an anonymous still will tell you that when you stop referring to yourself as an addict, that's your first step toward a relapse. And for me, it was a step into freedom because I stopped identifying myself as an addict. Now, the reality of struggling with the disease of addiction is very, very real, and I can never go back to those things. I'm not saying that. But... Addict is uh, an identity label. It is saying that I am this. And at Hope Church, we use the term, 
user. Because what happens is it brings everyone into a place of understanding that no matter what it is, anger, jealousy, pride, Facebook, Instagram, heroin, alcohol, we're using something to cover up who we are as image bearers, right? And so we're all users of something. And the term addict places this kind of weightiness on this sin where we say, God views all sin the same, but we don't. So if you struggle with drug addiction and alcoholism or sexual addiction or something like that, you're kind of over here. Um, and, and you can come to some things, but you're not really fully welcome. Like that's who you are. But if you're, it's just anger, jealousy, pride, welcome, come on in, right? And so we at Hope, we want to kind of renorm that and lead people to a place of understanding that, dude, Christ sets you free. And free is free, indeed. That's it. And so, uh, anyways, yeah. I, sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I should, why did I even preach? I should just like turn it over and go, man, take off, take off. I love it. I love it. Um, Joel's slightly passionate about this. <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, no, dude, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going we're gonna to circle back around to that. Um, Zach, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your connection like, to ministry and what you're doing at Project Connect and why, like, what that means. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, like Jason said, my name is Zach Bevel, and I am going to start like Joel did and say I'm husband to Marna Jane, and I have two awesome kids that are sitting right here. Um, my life in ministry has been a long a long journey to get to a place where I am now able to say that I work full-time in ministry. And God has done a whole bunch of work in me to get me to that place where I said, okay, because he was telling me that he wanted me to go there for a long time before I really did. Um, and he actually used a whole lot of things in my life, including using to get me to a place where uh, I wanted to go into full-time ministry because uh, as, and so today's sermon really resonated so deeply with me because uh, forgiveness, grace, absolutely. For what? Transformation, hope, healing. And so I wanted to be able to share those things with other people because I had experienced them at a very deep level. Mm. And so... Uh, I found a place where I was able to do that, and that place is called Project Connect Nashville. And what we do at Project Connect is we work to break the poverty cycle in individuals' lives through relationships, resources, and education. And we do all of that in partnership with the local church. And so uh, it sounds, it's a pretty big mission statement, right? I mean, we're talking about breaking the poverty cycle. This is a very complex issue in our society. Um, we more broadly define poverty than just material poverty. Poverty is not just about a lack of resources or lack of money. Uh, we define poverty as broken relationships. Mm. And so when we understand that poverty is broken relationships, first and foremost, uh, a broken relationship to God. And so we all have our own forms of poverty. And so uh, through Jesus, that brokenness is being made right, right? Our debt's been paid. We have the righteousness of Jesus because we are his people. And so we're made right. And all those relationships are now being made right. So our relationship to God, our relationship to ourselves, our relationship to others and to the rest of creation, all those broken relationships are being made right through the work of Christ in our lives. And so uh, when we look at poverty, in that sense, we all understand it in a totally different way. And I began to understand, oh, these are my people. People that know their brokenness and that are being transformed through Jesus Christ are my people. And so at Project Connect Nashville, we get to do that by walking alongside people long term. Um, and yes, we work with people who are in material poverty but simply addressing material needs and issues is, uh, it's not the whole solution. Um, the only solution is the gospel, it's Jesus, and it's what that means for all of our lives in all of the areas of our lives. Hmm. 
is it safe to say that that idea of forgiveness and gospel, like that initial gospel leap is kind of like the rock in the lake that then leads to a ripple effect, um, whether it be in the, in, as a user or as in broken relationships in poverty. I mean, just kind of like that initial drop is, what's in, is what sets off the transformation ripple effect in every other area of our life. Um, tell us just real quick, both of you guys, um, like th- there's a lot, as you guys can tell, there's a lot that's happening in these ministries. It's a multi-layered process. Um, and what I want us to do is just to kind of hear from these guys just very briefly. So as a church and as individuals, what do we do? How can we come alongside or even be involved in these two particular ministries? Joel, you want to kind of kick us off with that? Yeah. First, I would, um, I would just ask if you would be so bold to just raise your hand if you know someone or you are connected to someone who struggles with the disease of addiction. Mm. Just a show of hands. Mm. Yeah. Holy cow. Almost every person in here has their hand up. Man. Or every person does, basically. Um, we can't ignore it. It's everywhere. Mm. Statistically, there are people in this room who are trying to figure out what to do um, in their current battle with the disease of addiction. That's a reality. And so I think coming to terms as individuals, coming to terms with the scope and the reality of the situation, the urgency that's there, um, and to start breaking down the stigmas. And so it's for us with our personal relationships, how are we viewing people who are struggling with the disease of addiction And are we creating this separation between the sin that we deal with and the sin that they deal with? Um, And so I think it's going to take kind of a a frame shift. And I think that's happening here through the teachings and the community that we have here and how we view these things. Um, And uh, so that's first and foremost. And then your relationships in your workplace and in the streets and when you're seeing people on street corners and you're having conversations with people, understanding that we're all image bearers. And so starting to try and tear down those walls of stigma. Um, And if you yourself are searching for a place to to find recovery, and it doesn't have to be, like I said, from some overt addiction like drugs or alcohol or pornography or something. It's anything. If you're struggling with anger or lust or pride or brokenness in relationships or whatever it is, we welcome you to a recovery program that Zach and a team of people started and I came in kind of right as they were about to launch called ID Recovery, Identity Recovery. And it started a couple months ago at the Project Connect location in Madison and we are bringing a second meeting here to Hope starting in May. Um, And it is for anyone searching for recovery from anything. And so we invite you to be a part of that for yourself. We invite you to be supportive of the community that comes into here. And then as a church, partnering with Project Connect, and he'll give you a little bit of that, but we also work with People Loving Nashville. And we, the partnerships that we have encompass all of this stuff. The places where we go, they are rich and wrought with people who are in need of recovery, uh, much like ourselves. So I just look into our partnerships, and I have some more information on that in a little bit. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Zach, what can we do, man? Yeah, um, I love this question because at Project Connect, we actually say so 50% of our ministry is to people that are in material poverty, and 50% of our ministry is actually to the church Hmm. Um, because if we understand poverty holistically, we understand that as God's people, uh, as we are agents of his healing and of his restoration in the world and specifically in the areas of poverty and of material poverty. And so um, everything that we do at Project Connect Nashville is done in partnership with the local church. We exist to actually equip and empower the people of God to do the work of poverty alleviation alongside of us. And so, excuse me, we have... uh, all kinds of educational opportunities. We have workforce development classes, financial education classes, uh, classes that deal with trauma. We also meet people where they're at. So we serve food 
We have a meals program at our site in North Nashville. We also serve food with all of the classes that we offer. Uh, we worship together. We build community. And so opportunities to volunteer and to get involved with all of those areas, uh, they abound. So you can, uh, you can, all of our classes are actually taught by volunteer facilitators. Um, we also invite people to become allies in classes. And what an ally is, is it's simply a friend, someone who comes and sits in Project Connect Nashville to take class alongside the people in our program and to get to know them through learning together because everybody learns in these classes. So that's actually how I got involved at Project mm -hmm. Connect was uh, I'd done a little bit of volunteering here and there, but then I got involved as an ally going to class every week and I really started to get to know people and it changed my life. Mm -hmm. And so um, I invite you to come do that. Uh, but if you don't want your life to change, don't come. <laughs> Because it's wow. a dangerous thing. You may end up working there, so watch out. Uh, um, I suppose to mic the, to drop the mic after you say something like that, dog. <laughs> I'm still learning. Um, we as a church are actually going to be uh, serving on one Sunday evening. It's May 9th. Sunday, May 9th. Uh, so at Project Connect on Sunday evenings, we have multiple classes that happen all at once. And then we serve a meal and we worship together. And so we invite churches and groups of people to come to bring the meal, to do childcare during classes, and then to also uh, lead worship. And so this is a great opportunity to come, to serve, but also to experience and to see and learn more about what Project Connect Nashville is doing. Mm. Mm. And uh, both of these guys will be down here at the end of the service for you guys to ask individual questions if y'all want to do that and get some more information. But, uh, let's, uh, let's just stand together and pray as uh, and the band's going to make their way up as we kind of close out this part of the service. God, thank you for um, these guys. Thank you for Zach and thank you for Joel and what you're doing in their lives and in their ministries. God, thank you for the way that you've used them to impact my life and what you're doing um, just in our city because of their faithfulness. And God, we just ask that as we, um, as we come alongside of them, as we partner with them, God, that as Zach just said, that it wouldn't just be something we're doing, but it's something that, that it's being done to us. And we experience transformation in the midst of that journey. God, may we be a people who, doesn't, who don't just say, hey, I'm sorry, and then move on. But God, may we be a people who are transformed by what you have done on our behalf and are doing in our lives on a daily basis. May we be with you, become like you, and then do what you would do if you had our jobs, our, our marriages, our kids, our neighbors. God, if you had our personality issues and even our addictions. God, thank you for my friends that are gathered here today. Continue to speak, continue to move. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.